Mandizi Bulisele, Ku President, and the Commander in Chief of the Economic Freedom Fighters. The Bulisego Commissar, Bulisego Fighters. Greetings to Africans in the diaspora. Greetings to the structures of the economy freedom fighters in Africa, people of the world. Today, we are going to be talking to the second non-negotiable pillar. As we all know that this July month, EFF is going to be celebrating on the 26th of this month, the seventh anniversary. And this seventh anniversary will be celebrating our seven non-negotiable pillars. So a day before yesterday, the deputy president of the EFF spoke at length about the first non-negotiable pillar, explained the why, the how, and how to achieve it. I understand that many people then ask themselves, what will happen to what is beneath the soil? Today, we are going to answer that question. There's one thing we need to understand, commissars and fighters, and the people of South Africa and Africa. A founding manifesto of the EFF is a standing document, a document that can never, ever, ever be changed. So we can go to conferences and change the leadership change certain policies, enhance on some, but the founding manifesto remains the pillar and a document that explains the reasons why EFF had to exist. So cardinal pillar number two is one of the seven non-negotiable cardinal pillars in the document, which is a founding manifesto. So one day I had to explain to my husband that the seven non-negotiable pillars, they work together. So the question was, I am a fighter. I subscribe to the seven non-negotiable pillars and I believe in them. But I want to understand, are we going to first achieve the expropriation and then go to nationalization and then go to capacitating the state then go to health and etc etc so what's going to happen i made an example to him that it's called pillars those that are coming from rural areas will understand there's a particular house that we build this house in the eastern cape we call it eight corners when you build these eight corners, you don't first start with one corner. All eight corners go up at the same time. So this is how the cardinal pillars of the EFF work. They are the pillars in which the organization is standing on. And they go up together and they will meet each other at some point and we then achieve everything. So you cannot, after you have expropriating the land, not decolonize education so that you take away the biology of low caste, the flies, and 
entrench a new system of agriculture when you nationalize the mines you put in a curriculum in place that is going to address the needs of the mines the needs of the refineries the needs of capacitating the states the state how do you unblock a drain that's a scale on its own so all these things will go together but they go according to one to seven in a document it doesn't mean we're going to achieve one and then come to two and then come to three now this second non-negotiable pillar is nationalization of mines banks and all strategic sectors without compensation you must underline that without compensation what do we mean by nationalization? When we speak of nationalization, we mean the transfer of private ownership to the public ownership, which can happen with or without compensation. How do you then determine with or without compensation? You determine this through a method in which these mines, which are not now under the state, were acquired by a private sector. And if a mean of acquiring that mine was not on a legal basis or is on a lease basis, you simply discontinue it. So we have to take the means of production away from the capitalist class, which is in fact a minority, and transfer it to the people. But of course, the people will not individually take over their ownership. There has to be someone doing it on behalf of them, which is the state. So once the state takes over, it will then decide what to produce and decide how to distribute it. Where does nationalization come from? With the history of South Africa, we will just take it to the generation of 1955 when they adopted the Freedom Charter as a mean to drive the freedom of the people politically, economically, to achieve social democracy, justice for the people and detach themselves from the claws of the colonizers and the imperialists. So in this particular document, the people in 1955 said South Africa belongs to all who live in it. They said the wealth of the country shall be shared amongst the people. What does that mean? That then means that all the minerals and the petroleum resources that are found beneath the soil of South Africa the territory of South Africa, all of that which is found beneath the soil is not belonging to an individual who mines it. It belongs to the people of South Africa. And then nationalization was advocated for to a level of 
many our of our leaders got arrested some went to exile some were killed we still live with the horrors of the fights of the freedom fighters of the time we live with the horrors of images of this courageous leadership that took over and advocated for nationalization so what they wanted to achieve was that the global markets and the domestic markets only achieve its successful economy building through nationalizing all the strategic central economies of each country. So minerals is one of the economies that are very, very important in building of one's country. And after that, the fight continued. We got to 1990, uh, that Daniel Nelson Mandela gets released from jail, February 1990. So, Two years later, there was a Davos conference. We all understand what happens in Davos. It's a World Economic Forum meeting stage where the world meets, deal with economies of countries strategies and how to build their economies going forward. What works, what will work for each country, what will work for the world. But when Tata Nelson Mandela went to this meeting, he went with other leaders of the liberation movement, went with, and of course, the business sector attended. The likes of Oppenheimer, Rupert, the Minel. And we all understand what happens at that stage. That the right wingers fight tooth and nail to sustain their hegemony over the developing countries. And they have access to the big business people of each country. So our Stellenbosch crew has access to the world. They can communicate without the political side of things. So when they get to that stage, the lobbying becomes easier for them. Now here is Tata Mandela caught up in this meeting that is talking to economies. But one thing that he understands is that the people must benefit in the wealth of their own country. But things go south. And in a manner in which the meeting addresses economies and nationalization in particular is placed as something that's so bad that we can't do it. If we do it, we are going to make our country poor, we are going to kill a lot of people, we are going to lose a lot of jobs and all such. Now. What he does, he comes back to the comrades. He tells the comrades, it looks like we'll find ourselves 
in the same situation where Chuba is. What did that then mean? It meant that nationalization has to be put on hold. But this is not only the red flag. We would understand the red flags on the sunset clauses. And because of such Foshian pets that the leaders agreed to, they made a deal with the devil. It compromised the position of the Freedom Charter. So when it compromised that position, we then found ourselves with political power, but with no economic power, in which we can only achieve it if we nationalize the mines and have full control of them. If we don't have full control, we're not going to benefit anything. Now we say nationalize the mines. We need full control there. The banks, the financial sector becomes the most strategic sector in the economy. So any country that builds its economy, it boils down to the banks. So if you don't own the banks, you are not going to win. If you don't own the strategic sectors, where the kind of industries that can be, if they get monopolized and the state loses the grip of it, it will not achieve any of the objectives of the Freedom Charter. It will not even achieve the basic necessity for its own people. So when we say basic necessities, we know what we mean. We need access to water. Can't uh, monopolize water. can privatize it. You can't privatize electricity because people need it. You can't privatize roads, the infrastructure, your railways telecommunications, the oil companies, and the mineral companies. Once you privatize all that, you set yourself as a state for a failure. Because you cannot regulate the people who you have no control over. Even if you regulate each industry, but you are subjected to meet certain boundaries at which you cannot extend yourself further in, in a way where you are going to favor the needs of the people of the country. Now the EFF comes and we call again for what the Freedom Charter wanted to achieve. We say, dust it off, bring it back here. Let's now again talk about it. So we understand that the EFF is the last hope to deal with these matters. Now we say, in order to achieve this, we need to nationalize the mines. Why do we need to do it now? Especially now. 10 million people in South Africa whom are capable and willing to work and relocate anywhere in the country to find work. They can't find it. We have more than 60% of the households who are living on social grants simply because they can't make ends meet. They can't put food on the table. 
we have to increase the budget on social grants. Is that enough? We have the most unequal society. And terrifying enough, we are the most poverty stricken, yet we are the richest when it comes to the wealth we can count. We'll get to that and illustrate how we are the richest. So we need to transfer the wealth. We need this method or mechanism to be put in motion in order for us to nationalize. So when we talk to the nationalization of mines, I want to first illustrate to you how the capitalist system is not helping South Africans and not creating jobs and not just jobs, but sustainable, well-paying jobs. The mines in the economy, true tax, which is a method used in South Africa to gain some kind of profit through the minerals. All these mines combined, we collected plus minus 20 billion. What is 20 billion to the trillion plus of the tax collected in South Africa from the minerals? Given the amount of profit they make, it's about 1% of our tax collection. That's the mineral. And we collect in terms of royalties something like six billion. What is that? It's an insult to the people who, who have to benefit. How do you share only six billion to the population of South Africa? Whom are the people if we have a state that case and a state that have advocated for the freedom charter, for the wealth of this country to be shared to the people of South Africa. How do you justify such an insult? Now, we have these people who are mining, who can easily escape tax, who are not adhering to their social responsibilities. What then, what, what's there? What, what, what are we waiting for? We have to discontinue the system that's not working for the people of South Africa. We have to discontinue the imperialist means and ways of colonizing our people over and over in new ways every time. What do we need to do? We need our own state-owned mining company that is going to oversee this nationalization. They're taking over of this whole process. There is a, an existing mining company which the African um, Exploration Mining and Finance Corporations, but it's not controlling anything. And it hasn't transferred anything. So the, the kind of a state-owned company we're looking for is the one that's going to recognize the benefits and create a space of beneficiation.
for the people. Create business for small enterprises, create business for individual, and most of all, create sustainable employment, skill, upgrading, and the upkeep of the infrastructure of this country. So there is now a document of, that is guiding how the minerals of this country are mined. It's just a document, it's just a paper. But funny enough, this document that is called the Mineral Resources, the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act of 2002. You would think our minds are nationalized when you read it. It's not the case. What happened is that all minerals were transferred to the custodian of the state. And to that, it says it must then establish the equitable access to the mineral and petroleum resources to all South Africans. Equitable access. We don't have such. And then lately there was a call for the amendment to the MPRDA that at least 30%, we must change the quarters that to 30% must be black owned. In a country where majority is black people. But our own charter says just 30%. Just give us 30%. We're begging, literally. And nothing is coming forth. As of now, the capitalist class and whites are controlling our minds. But the most terrible, terrible thing, they're exploiting our people through hard labor and salaries that are not paid accordingly. What are we talking about here? Where are these mines? South Africa has got about 53 different minerals that are beneath its soil, which have been already discovered and being mined. We have 1,700 mines that are operating in South Africa. Out of that, we only have 450,000 people who are working there, hard labor, not being paid enough, not having decent housing, not having access to water, not having electricity. Let's take the example of Marikana, where the miners were on strike for a minimum wage, which was 12,500. And go to the community or communities where these miners were coming from. See the conditions they live under and understand the call of that 12.5, where it come from. They, these are men and women with families, and most of them, they are cross-province families, where one person have to take care not of one or two families, but sometimes three families on a 4,000 rand. And that's what we're facing, and that's what we say must change.
South Africa is rated globally as the first country with the best platinum. We have more than 140 years of gold. We have diamonds, of uranium. We, 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 we do nothing about and the sad part of this, that there is private ownership of our own minerals, is now illustrated with the worst and human manner in which the mining minister or ministers, starting from Shabangu to now Kwetemantashe, are handling the matter of Kolobin simply because the capitalists from Australia, they want access and they are ready to license it to them. They are not ready to make the Kolobin community benefit. There is no beneficiation. However, whatever is beneath the soil of Kolobin must be dug out, must go to Australia, Go wherever. Get those people to benefit. People of Colombia must just be uprooted, taken to a two-bedroom. Those that come from rural areas, again, will understand the setup of homes, beautiful homes we have in South Africa. Our families, poor or rich, they have built beautiful homes. They don't have only one house in their high yard. They've got like four or five. You want to take a family of 10, 15, 20 to a two-bedroom house simply because an Australian company says, I need to access that mineral. This has also opened opportunities of opportunist corrupt leaders who make deals with these big companies to take over simply because they're going to line their own pockets. And when they line their own pockets, they don't care what happens to the next person. That's not what the Freedom Charter wanted. That's not what the Freedom Charter said. The Freedom Charter said the moment you find that wealth, the people must benefit it. And the people of Kolobin are on that mandate. They are saying the mandate is one. We, the people of Kolobin, must be the first ones. You are not going to put profits first and then us behind. And you don't care what happens to us. So these superficial uh, things that are happening about tourism that's going to happen, them getting jobs, jobs where? What is the regulated minimum wage today? 3.5. Those mineral workers there are going to be subjected to a mere 3.5 for trillions of rents to live and leave them in poverty again. What is it that's going to change for that community? It's a clear example of why we are in a state in which we are in, simply because we have leadership that does not care. And today we say, nationalize that mine, take control of it, beneficiate the people, find ways that suit the conditions and the environment of the Colombian people and work with them. But if you go, you want them to work for the Australian company, there's no guarantees. We've been working for Anglo Platinums. We've been working for London. We've been working for, what did we get? Nothing. So nationalization becomes very important because the state will then see the importance of upholding the needs of the people before the profits. So when we talk beneficiation, what do we mean? 
we mean that this state-owned company will have then to create an environment and a space in which the raw material is going to come out of the soil, is going to go into the refinery, is going to be cut, is going to be polished, is going to be made beautifully into whatever it has to come out to be. If it's a diamond, it has to go into our rings, our earrings, and anything else that is made of diamond. And it has to be finished here, not somewhere else. And once it is finished here, that company has to oversee the trading. How do we export it? And not us exporting our raw material in huge numbers and import the finished product who then benefited in that process so the finished product must be ours the upskilling of whatever is required your geologists your environmentalists jewelry cutters and everyone is going to be part of what that mining company with this education system of South Africa and see how we work together as mines and education center to decolonize the education and make it fit for purpose. Right now we have structural and unemployment Simply because we have the imbalance of the locust biology we, 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 we learned. And today, a skill that's required is none of the things I read in my biology, is none of the things I read about in my geography, is none of the things I read about in my history. So once this process is taken over by that state-owned mining company. It's going to start aligning itself with the necessary departments to establish relationships where it comes to skill. Our FETs must be fit for the challenge. Our universities must produce what is required in the market of South Africa. True this system of beneficiation. So you see how then this beneficiation becomes an umbrella that addresses a whole lot of challenges that we're facing as South Africans. We make pots for them to shine. We need a mineral. We make rings, we make jewelries. There is coal that we burn for electricity, for, for, for ESCO. But all of that does not belong to us. We have to buy it through a third party with all other uh, 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 prices that are already added to it and we, we no longer afford. That is why today, People are saying, no, ESCO must be privatized. These, these South Africans cannot uh, uh, control it. The moment you mention the word nationalization, you are looked at, at like some mad person. You are reminded of how you are going to take the country back to Zimbabwe. You are reminded of how you are going to take the country back to Venezuela. For what? You're reminded of how the black government cannot govern. Simply because they know the benefit of holding on to these strategic sectors and the minerals. The moment they lose that power and the hold they have over these strategic sectors, they understand very well the losing of that income the loss that's coming with it is going to benefit the people whom they have no care in the world for them. So 
beneficiation is something that is required not any time but now and we are only going to realize beneficiation through the mines on our state-owned mining company when we nationalize the mines i'm going to make a, an example when uh, there is oil in the strip of between Scotland and Norway. So the British opted to privatize the mines, the same system we have here in South Africa. The Norwegians opted for a public control. Let me tell you today, go and read about it. Up to so far, the Scotlands have only benefited 1%. The very same thing that's happening to us, benefiting like something called 6 billion a year from our minerals. But the Norwegians, they get dividends. They get paid royalties out of their oil simply because the state took over control, managed it, practiced the beneficiation, established all the sectors that are going to look after and ensure the production, the, and the creation of jobs, the upskilling, and everything. And today, Norwegians are the most happy when it comes to beneficiation. And literally, they get individual benefits out of it. We don't want to mention their infrastructure is the best. Because it's taken care of by the proceeds of their own wealth. No, it's not someone else is benefiting on their behalf and giving them crumbs. But they do it themselves. They realize the profits. They see the profits. They see how where to improve they see the failures in the system if they ask any they deal with them and in that way they get to benefit so when people are always comparing us with others failed states i will tell you today beyond the so-called failure there is a capitalist system and the sanctions. Remember when I opened, I said, Mandela came back to his comrades and said, if we don't want to look like Cuba, let's put this nationalization on ice. And here we are. Simply because we don't want to look like them. So every time you mention it, they are going to take you there. They want to instill this fear in you so that you are always fearing for the worst. And the mentality that we are always going to have is that we are dependent only to the capitalist class for us to understand what mining is. That's not how it works. Because the very same capitalist class when it comes here, it doesn't bring the skill, the skill is here. It doesn't bring the hard labor, the labor is here. It doesn't bring the land, the land is here. It doesn't bring these minerals, the minerals are here. So what are we waiting for? It's ours. Now let's go to the banks. The EFF has already tabled in Parliament a bill on nationalization of the Reserve Bank. The bill is going to be heard. It's under the name of the President, Silo Julius Malema. It's going through the processes. And the nationalization of this uh, Reserve Bank it's going to be done without compensation. Why? Because 
It's a system that we just have to discontinue. We don't owe anyone anything. We just have to discontinue the system. So through parliament, the necessary legislation will be passed and the Reserve Bank will be nationalized. We need to differentiate, though, the nationalization of the Reserve Bank is not the issues of the mandate of the Reserve Bank. Now we want to talk to the Reserve Bank at, and then we deal with the issues of the mandate of the Reserve Bank. Why do we have to do that? The sovereignty of this country and its success economically is centered around the Reserve Bank. It's in charge of the financial sector. It's in charge of the banking system that keep the monies of these people who are mining, that allows the laws and the taxes to skip the countries. Let's remember the inquiry which was held by former President Tabombegi on illicit financial flows. And how do we lose in Africa and South Africa as a country on the taxes that leave us, not come to us? So all those things, once the national treasury and the parliament, the legislative arm, and the Reserve Bank are under the control of the state. They are going to be balanced. We are not going to have an issue of having banks that cannot have certain licenses simply because they are black. That cannot be bailed simply because we don't feel like it. It's actually imminent that the bank, the Reserve Bank of South Africa must be nationalized. We'll understand that the ruling party has resolved on that. It's our founding document that says we must do it. We are in fact the only eight countries who are amongst the only eight countries whose central banks are not nationalized. So why the rest of the world have nationalized their central banks? It's to align the mandate of the legislative arm with the resources of the country. So the monetary policy cannot be decided outside what the legislative arm is seeking to achieve on the basis of social welfare. We want roads, we want water, we want, but our reserve bank is monetary fund and then the fiscal policy. They don't talk to each other. Because we have other people in that side, we have other people this side. So we then go forward to formulate our own state bank. Let me quote what President Julius Malema said in one of the summits here in Cape Town when he was addressing the business sector. He says, open quote, when we're talking about nationalization of banks in South Africa, we don't mean that we're going to take APSA from Maria Ramos and Rupert. Our state-owned bank will have a full license and compete on the same level as others, close quote. So when we want our own state-owned bank, we want it because it must talk to credit access. That doesn't have color, because suddenly in South Africa, credit has got color. There is a, 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 a consultant that is working with people, in particular the ones that have borrowed money to pay, to buy um, cars from West Bank, and how West Bank is charging interest based on the color of the people. 
We need a bank that's not going to look at the color. We need a bank that is not going to make you pay 20 years for a home, whereas you buy a car now and pay it off five years time. But when you buy a house, you must pay 20 years. We need a bank that's not going to bring us the exorbitant interest, which is unreasonable and unjustified. We know the, 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 the existing ones, AFSA, ABSA, FNB, Net Bank, Capitec. And we don't mean the system that they are in. We mean a system that is going to be a state-owned bank and a bank that's going to have its own management and is going to work in the interest of our people. So the Reserve Bank had placed some laws guiding and regulated the ways in which the banks in South Africa must work. But none of us are owning the banks. What we celebrate is the issue that 50% of um, board directors in these banks are black people, 36% of managers are black people in the country, and uh, there's almost, in terms of the staff complement, there's like 80% of black people. But what are we? Workers. We're not owning any means of production. So we need a state bank that's going to deal and occupy the space of the financial sector. We know its centrality in economy and how it drives the economy. Because the money that's printed is distributed by the banks, the credit is handled by the banks, and even the payment of salaries of workers from different sectors, they go through those banks. So our state-owned bank must take charge of every cent of the state, every account of the state, every salary that goes out of the state should go through the state-owned bank. Now, we understand that many people have this question, that things have never worked. South Africa is bad in governing, but we have seen it happening in China. It's working smoothly. China has got its own industrial bank, agricultural bank, communications bank, and it channels that through to assist it and build other SOEs, infrastructure, the people are benefiting. The unemployment rate of China is very low. So South Africa must follow the same pattern. The EFF founding manifesto is clear and it's mentioning some of the banks that must be established. The state-owned bank should have also the agricultural bank so that when we get into expropriation of land, we do have an agricultural bank, a house state-owned bank, social assistance bank, and all of these things are possible. And the models that have been established and, and the system that is there, that's operating globally in terms of state-owned banks, it's working perfectly well. So there's nothing that's untoward about South Africa having its own state-owned bank that is going to coexist with the current ones, but with a different system. And currently we have African Bank. African Bank struggled, bailed out by the state. State owns majority share. Why don't we convert it into a state-owned bank, develop it, make it work for us, and have control over it uh, that's then going to achieve the mandate of a state-owned bank which works for the people. We also have telecommunication that we cannot leave to the private sector. We have day in, day out the cries of, data prices that are very high. There's no control 
in that sector because the state has not taken over its own telecommunication. We have SABC that we, we own as a state. We have to constantly support it, work with it, because it's the only one that's working for ourselves, is the only broadcaster that we pride ourselves with, and it's, it's the only channel of communication we as a state can claim that we own it. And the support of it, has, we, we, we must not be scared to call for it. There shouldn't be any fear or favor because that's, that's what has to happen. The EFF have been calling for a singing network owner or operator so that it, it, it can multiply itself in the retail space and help the South African in terms of telecommunication industry so that we are not sharing the infrastructure. And if the country can have its own, it means then the country will have achieved the mandate of its own telecommunications with reasonable prices, accessible to South Africans, and communication cannot be hindered. We find ourselves now under COVID-19 with children that have to go to school simply because we don't own telecommunications. Had we had our own telecommunications, it would have been easy to just find tablets uh, and, and, and send to different uh, schools to the children, have our systems operations in those tablets through our own state-owned telecommunication and communicate with children. And teachers have to communicate with children, have a class under our own network, which we are not going to have to pay exorbitant prices for it. The need is today, is now. And we have to realize this because the suffering is not just going to be the COVID-19. It's going to be bigger. The day we don't afford airtime, the day we don't afford data, the day we can't communicate, communication is the most important tool of a country's sovereignty. Because even if there's something bad happening, we depend on communication. If there's something bad happening, we depend on our own TV to broadcast it. We don't depend to other TV stations that belong to private people whom could be part of the problem or a danger that's coming into the country. So the communication, the telecommunication industry cannot belong to private sector. It's a very dangerous move that as, as, as South Africans we have. Now, um, with the proceeds, of the profit we have from our minerals when we have benefited and everything, we can then channel them to our own sovereign wealth fund, which is going to be a fund that keeps the profits and invest it for the people so that they can benefit further. And this investment can start happening in the African continent for the African economy development. Work with the African countries to establish sectors that are strategic in the African country. And all those surpluses out of it, we channel them back to the infrastructure, to the social welfare, to everything else that we need. When we say free decolonized education, we shouldn't be looking left and right where the money will come from. With the Sovereign Wealth Fund, we will then be able to achieve all the social welfare programs, 
we build our infrastructure, we help our people, and we will be helping the African continent as well. Let me go back to Norway again. Out of the oil proceeds, uh, pro profits, it developed and uh, it established um, its own sovereign wealth fund. So from that sovereign wealth fund, it's then able to channel it to the needs of the country and it invest it all over, build other assets of the states and, and establish other industries. And those state-owned assets, they become supervised very well. Now, in, the, in, 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 in South Africa, with the manifesto of um, 2019, we made a call that we will establish a state-owned asset supervision and administration commission, which its function will be to oversee all these other state-owned companies and intervene immediately as and when there are red flags so that we do not face a challenge where we are in today even when the red flags for SAA were there when the red flags for Denel for ESCOM no one intervened so that a uh, body the commission will deal strictly with the monitoring of the SOEs to ensure that there is no failure in the system. And once there are cracks showing in the system, it immediately goes in and deal with the failures. So I want to go back again and quote President Julius Malema in the very same conference he was addressing. There was a question posed around the nationalization and the instability that it can cause and all that. And his question was, if you want to point me every time we say nationalization to Venezuela, you want to point me to Zimbabwe, point me then to what achievement have the capitalist system done? Where has it succeeded? Show us, because what we see are the holes that they live where they have been digging our minerals, are the poverty-stricken communities that they left behind, are the schools that they did not develop, are the skills that they didn't care to develop, are the clinics that are in, in, in dire states, the environment that was left harmed and not conducive for people to live in because of the dust particles that are living in the air. And that remains a central question. If we always question why this nationalization is pushed so much, let's first look at who is opposing it is the right wing. You talk of nationalization in parliament, the DA will oppose it. The FF plus will oppose it. Why? Because they own the means of production. They focus on maximizing the profit. They don't care about the hard labor. 
that they're exploiting. They don't care about the environment. They don't care about the people. They don't care about you, whatever you benefit. They don't care if everyone will depend on social grants. That's what they want. They don't want sustainable jobs to be created for our people. They don't want an environment where the infrastructure could be easily built by the state companies, where the banks of the state will be giving credit to its own people, not based on color, but based on, 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 on affordability. And they don't give uh, uh, houses to black people in the areas where are deemed white only areas. So that's the fear that's there. And somehow, some of the black people have found themselves riddled into this system and they can get themselves out of it. Nationalization of mines, the banks and all strategic workers is the only way that we can achieve the distribution of wealth to every South African. Now, what's going to happen just before I finish? We are going to be faced with a whole lot of resistance. But this resistance is going to be coming from the right. And divide the left. So when that happens, we must be ready to fight. We must be ready to do what we have been saying we want to do. That we will do anything for a black child. If we cannot do this through legislation and through the civil manner, there are other methods to do it. And that's what we don't want to do. We cannot resort to that other method of doing things because we are a peaceful people. We are a peaceful country. We want peace. We just want the transfer of wealth to the people whom are the rightful owners. So we, we are well aware of what the IMF and the World Bank has written in its own conditions to restrict the governments on what they can and cannot do. But we are not part of that. We want to rid ourselves of this terrible situation, this debt we are in, we can't pay off. But we cannot if we don't own anything. Fighters, if we cannot fight together, we are all going to die. We need to make a pledge and pledge that we as South Africans will fight for the wealth of the generation of 1955, a generation before that, the generation to come. And we cannot be part of the failure when we lost the plot in realizing the dreams of the generation of 1955. Thank you very much.